Chapter 4, The Constitution of the Individual This chapter examines H. V. Blavatsky's presentation of the human constitution in the ancient Egyptian religion. By constitution I mean the total conception of what makes up a complete human being. The human constitution, or microcosm, is a central topic of theosophy and of the secret doctrine. The second volume of the secret doctrine, entitled Anthropogenesis is an outline of the evolution of life in general on earth and of human life in particular. This volume covers the historical evolution of humanity, and, related to this, the gradual unfolding of the human individual. Coupled with the first volume of the secret doctrine, entitled Cosmogenesis, these two volumes cover in scope the microcosmic and macrocosmic teachings of theosophy. Following some introductory comments, the first section of this chapter is an outline of the general theosophical presentation of the human constitution in its own terms. The second section presents H. B. Blavatsky's statements on the constitution of the human being in the Egyptian religion. In the third section of this chapter, I outline the views of contemporary mainstream Egyptology and compare them in brief against the theosophical presentation. My primary aim is to present the teachings of H. P. Blavatsky on the Egyptian human constitution as outlined in the secret doctrine. I will, however, draw on her other writings, where appropriate. Link to this is an assessment of her views against those of contemporary Egyptologists. Two secondary aims are to identify the sources H. P. Blavatsky drew on and to examine the ways in which she drew the concepts of ancient Egypt into her theosophical scheme, or, conceived alternately, how she inserted her theosophical content into the Egyptian religion. The two theosophical methods of comparison are the structural placement onto the theosophical template of Egyptian concepts, and a functional evaluation of Egyptian principles against theosophical conceptions, as these are the methods through which theosophy engages with world religions. It is also by means of these two processes structural placement, and functional evaluation, that the academic can assess the theosophical presentation. I find the idea of structural comparisons persuasive as it is on the identification of patterns and relationships between concepts that much of the theosophical interpretation of religion rests. From the theosophical perspective their pattern or grid represents the totality of all that exists from the highest spiritual realms to the lowest material expression as there can be nothing. Outside of these parameters, everything must have its place on it. The functional evaluation also invariably resolves various concepts onto the structural theosophical grid. These modes of evaluation are inevitable, as in the theosophical conception nature is ordered and sequential, unfolding and set patterns. For members, the theosophical teachings in the Theosophical template are descriptions of nature itself. The theosophical teachings are presented as being scientific, true, rational, verifiable and objective statements about nature. The different world religions, from the theosophical perspective, also attempt to describe the same object, nature as it is. According to theosophy, each religion is successful in this endeavor to varying degrees. It is also the Theosophical contention that the founding root of the world's various religions was the uniform ancient wisdom tradition. All that is required to unlock the hidden intent and content contained in world religions is a common terminology, the theosophical terminology. With this theoretical background, theosophy seeks to locate its basic teachings in the religions of the world. I have discussed this in more detail in Chapter 3. For theosophists then, there exists a fundamental relationship between Egyptian and theosophical conceptions of the individual. As both are describing the same object, it remains for theosophical insights to unlock the true meaning of Egyptian text. True religion is about describing nature as it is, and it remains for theosophy to evaluate the extent to which world religions have accomplished this. For the academic, the process of evaluating the Theosophical process of comparison is accomplished by a common language, English, and 
resort to the level of definition of each tradition. It may be suggested that entertaining the theosophical statements in this manner is somehow sympathetic to theosophical thought, in line with Hanegraaff's methodological agnosticism, however, this seems unavoidable. The functional comparison will also entail looking at concepts and ideas that are more fundamental level than that of simple comparison of place in a structure. The function and action of an entity, or aspect of an entity, in the theosophical imagination, will be an important basis by which comparable concepts in the Egyptian religion can be located. An example of theosophical attempts to correlate the Egyptian and theosophical scheme can be found in the following table, which I reproduce and adapt from an article, Egyptian Teachings in the Light of Theosophy. Table 1, Microcosmic and Macrocosmic Correspondences. Formless, 1, Milky Way. Horus the 2, Seraphim Dash. Nebulae, Comets. Elder 3, Cherubim, Fixed. Stars. Rob Paramatman. 4, Thrones, Saturn Osiris Aku, Atman. 5, Dominations. Jupiter. Isis Kaibit, Buddha. Form, 6. Virtues, Mars Ba, Hiramanas. Horus the 7. Powers, Sun Thoth Ab, Lower Manas. Younger 8. Principalities. Venus. Set Ku, Kona. 9. Archangels. Mercury. Anubis Anch, Lingus Ariria. Angels, Moon Nephthys, Prana, Ua. Men, Earth Cot, Stula Serira. Wellens and Oderberg, 1941, page 428. This article is one of few I have found which discusses theosophical and Egyptian correspondences in some detail. For example, combinations of gods are discussed and equivalent theosophical terms proposed. I have encountered a number of comparative lists by post Blavatsky theosophical authors. Another example, from a pseudonymous Hetep N. Netter, correlates the principles as follows. Table 2, Egyptian and Theosophical Principles. Egyptian Principle Kod Kabet Sekim Ank Ba and Ab Ka Akta Abode of The Gods Theosophical Principle Body Stula Sarira Linga Sarira Kama Prana Lower Manus Higher Manus Buddha All Dash Inclusive Principle Life I extrapolate That Atman is Meant Though it Is not so Stated 1937 Page 21 we can immediately note that the order differs from that of Table 1. This type of discrepancy raises a number of issues, particularly in relation to the content-specific nature of the theosophical statements and the essentially definitive nature of the ancient wisdom tradition. It is not, however, my intention to discuss these presentations in detail here. Relevant to my dissertation is that this type of comparison is fundamental to the theosophical Endeavor of interpreting and appropriating. In theory, one can now reread an Egyptian text, substituting Egyptian words with the theosophical equivalents. Theosophical meaning is inserted into Egyptian texts through this system of correspondence. In theosophical works, selected quotations and dislocated extracts are often presented as supporting the general theosophical interpretation. Rarely does one find in the writings of H. P. Blavatsky a sustained, detailed study to prove a particular thesis of correspondence. This type of sustained engagement with the original text can also be rare, though not totally unknown to, in theosophical literature in general. This is possibly because, in theosophical circles, it is presumed that Theosophy and H. P. Blavatsky have something legitimate to say about a given topic. Its importance or relevance does not need to be proved it is presumed, and rests to a large extent on the charisma and authority of H. P. Blavatsky and the Mahatmas. It is also possible that theosophists have, to a certain extent, abandoned the attempt to engage with mainstream scholarship. 
This the contextualizing and a historical selection of quotations is fundamental to the theosophical engagement with Egyptian texts. I suspect that, without the enabling power of this process of uncritical selection, much theosophical commentary would become mired in irresolvable internal debate and argumentation. 4.1 Introductory Background The sevenfold presentation of the human constitution is a fundamental tenet of mature theosophy. While the exact nature of the principles did evolve in the theosophical presentation of H. B. Blavatsky, the basic sevenfold structure remained constant. Three, it is generally argued by scholars that she did not present a sevenfold constitution and Isis unveiled four. Instead, a threefold division was outlined. Retrospectively, H. B. Blavatsky explained this by suggesting the sevenfold division was too dangerous to reveal at the time to an unprepared audience. While H. V. Blavatsky does admit that other divisions of the individual, for example fourfold, fivefold, etc., can exist as functional esoteric systems, she resolves them into her sevenfold presentation, which assumes ancient primacy. Five, the secret doctrine presents the familiar theosophical sevenfold human constitution. I will examine only the principles, and any refinement of the theosophical presentation of the principles, insofar as an explanation of H. V. Blavatsky's writings on ancient Egypt requires it. In the theosophical system, the division of the seven human principles form a homology with the sevenfold division of the macrocosm. In theosophical thought, the microcosm slash macrocosm scheme can be configured in various ways. The macrocosm is usually figured as either the Earth planetary chain or the solar system as a whole. The microcosm is then conceived as being the human individual. It could, however, be the planetary chain of the Earth conceived as the microcosm and the solar system the macrocosm. There could be various permutations. The human microcosm is also intimately related to the evolutionary rounds and races teachings of theosophy. Each principle continues evolving and manifesting itself during the corresponding rounds and root races. This system of correspondence is very important in Theosophy, and it dominates the esoteric writings of H. P. Blavatsky. Everything is built into a system of relationships, from colors, sounds, metals, states of matter, to body parts, planets, and so on. H. P. Blavatsky notes in her collected works volume 12, the correspondences between colors, sounds and principles were given, and those who have read the second volume of The Secret Doctrine will remember that these Seven principles are derived from the seven great hierarchies of angels or Dhyani Chans, which are, in their turn, associated with colors and sounds, and form collectively the manifested logos. 1980, page 561 In terms of human evolution, during each of the seven rounds and root races, a different principle and sub-principle is evolved. In the Theosophical Conception, General Humanity, at present, is said to be in the fourth round in the fifth root race. This effectively means that humanity is evolving the mental, manas, fifth, subdivision of the comma principle, fourth principle. What is important to note here is that the seven principles are directly related to the seven races and, in a broader context, to the seven rounds and even to the seven sacred planets of our solar system. This system of correlation is relevant because if, for example, a religion was found to teach only a fivefold division of the individual this would create a potential interpretive problem for theosophy as the link to the root races would be difficult to establish. See Appendix 4. An interesting introductory study of the seven principles as represented by H. P. Blavatsky and later theosophical writers can be found in Julie Hall's article, The Saptaparna, the Meaning and Origins of the Theosophical Septenary Constitution of Man. 2007, page 5386 This is a wide-ranging article outlining the evolution of the presentation of the sevenfold constitution in Theosophical Writings, discussing potential sources for the teaching, and ending with a view on the Orientalism charge against Theosophy. It is useful to sketch very briefly, as a general background, some of the points she raises focusing on origins and sources. 
a specific originating historical source for the sevenfold theosophical classification of the human constitution has not been located. From the potential Western sources, ancient Egypt, Neoplatonism, the Kabbalah, Paracelsus, Allan Kardec, and Spiritism are identified. Added. To this would be general traditional Western esoteric sources like Freemasonic literature and the writing of Jacob Bohm. Potential Eastern influences would be Vedanta and Mahayana. Buddhism. A likely important influence would have been T. Subaru, an early Eastern. Contact of H. B. Blavatsky who was a Brahmin lawyer. A synthesizing aspect would have been H. P. Blavatsky's own creative reordering and selection from these sources. Some of the potential specific literary sources which may have influenced H. P. Blavatsky are mentioned by Hall throughout her article. None of the Western or Eastern sources, however, reflect exactly the theosophical schema. Hall's article does not examine the potential correspondences between these various systems and the theosophical scheme. This absence in the article might give the impression that correspondences are somehow possible. By this I mean that there is some real basis for comparison. One may of course compare any two things with no real or potential correspondence being possible, irrespective of whether H. B. Blavatsky gave valid correspondences, the very process of comparison and paralleling is entertained. As I review the opinions of contemporary Egyptologists, we will see that this actual process is called into question. Contemporary Egyptologists call into question the imposition of Greek and Christian categories of body, mind, and soul onto Egyptian thought, which in position H.P. Blavatsky reflects. According to Egyptologists, the ancient Egyptians thought in a unique way about the human being, one which did not entertain the usual categories current in Greek and Western. Philosophical thought. The ability to think outside of these Western categories is a challenge. To theosophical thought and academic thought. A final point to note from Hall's article is that the theosophical scheme of the seven human principles was first presented in 1881 by A.O. Hume, four years after the publication of Isis. Unveiled. 2007. Page 5. Theosophical writings, prior to the presentation of the actual theosophical system, cannot show the same focus attempt of appropriation and reinterpretation. Theosophy needed to exist before it could begin engaging in detail with other world traditions. 4.2. The Seven Principles of the Human Constitution in Theosophy The sevenfold division of the human constitution is so fundamental to the theosophical Teachings that a basic form of it is presented in most theosophical books. Amongst others, the source I have found useful, and used, is Barberger's The Divine Plan. It has become popular to refer to various theosophies, for example that of Ledbetter, Besant, Blavatsky, etc. For this reason, when examining the thoughts of H. V. Blavatsky, as opposed to theosophy in a more general sense, it is important to refer to either primary texts of H. P. Blavatsky or to texts rooted directly in writings of H. P. Blavatsky so that theosophical systems are not confused. In practice, the separating is quite difficult owing to the interrelated nature of theosophical works in the way in which different ideas permeate the various theosophical societies in general. H. P. Blavatsky's presentation of the Egyptian principles is relatively brief, and, therefore, it is necessary to sketch only the basic outline of the theosophical principles here. There is some debate over the order and enumeration of the theosophical principles in her writings. These debates revolve chiefly around the order of the prana and linga sarira principles. In some of her writings, H. V. Blavatsky presented the order as Thula Sarira, Prana, Linga Sarira instead of the now more common Stula Sarira. Linga Sarira, Prana. While this is an interesting historical observation, it is essentially a non-issue in relation to my dissertation. In a table in the secret doctrine, she does tabulate the order as Stula Sarira, Prana, Linga Sarira. 1988, Volume 1, page 157 in that table, however, 
She identifies the Linga Sarira as the vehicle of Prana which in mind. Opinion reverses this order to reflect the more common presentation. William Kwan Judge Easily the most important member of the early Theosophical Society and a founding member. Remarked on this issue that the later arrangement does not substantially alter it. 1973, page 35 I will present various presentations from H.B. Blavatsky's writings. The principles are presented in various ways in H.P. Blavatsky's writings. The groupings are Not all simple equivalent presentations of the same object. The main difference is that some Principles are left out of the scheme, and, to make up the numbers, either a new principle is Inserted or existing principles are split. The sevenfold division, however, remains constant. I We'll tabulate some of the main presentations and then discuss the principles in more detail. Table 3, The Seven Theosophical Principles The Secret Doctrine Volume 1, PG 157 Pubble 1888 The Zerkoff The Dream That Never Dies, PG 117. Pubble. 1953. Duh. Zerkoff. The. Dream. That. Never. Dies. PG. 117. Pubble. 1953. Key 2. Theosophy. Page 90. Pubble. 1889. Blavatsky. Collected. Works. Volume 12, Diagram. I Pubble. 1889. 1890. Blavatsky. Collected. Works. Volume 12, page 529. Pubble. 1889. 1890. Blavatsky. Collected. Works. Volume 12, page 607. Pubble. 1889. 1890. Blavatsky. Collected. Works. Volume 12, page 614. Pubble. 1889. 1890. Inner. Group. Teachings. Page 107. Recorded. In 1890. Stula. Sriura. Stula. Sriura, Stula, Sriura, Rupa or Stula, Sriura, Linga, Sriura, Stula, Sriura, Linga, Sriura, Living, Body in, Prana or Animal, Life, Objective, Prana, Life, Linga, Sriura, Linga, Sriura, Prana 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 Linga, Sarira, Astral, The, Vehicle of, Prana Dash, Astral, Body, Linga, Sarira, Prana Prana Linga, Sharira, Kama, Rupa, Linga, Sarira, Lower, Manas, Kama, Rupa Kama, Prana, Kama, Rupa, Kama lower, manas. Kama rupa lower, manas. Kama manas kama, manas. Kama, manas. Mind manas higher, manas. Manas 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 buddha manas. Ego, manas. Higher ego. Spiritual. Soul dash. Buddha. Buddha 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 auric egg buddha buddha. Manas. Atma Atman 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 Oric Egg Oric Egg Atman Oric Egg Oric Egg. I include Boris to Zarkov's later presentation as this is the most common way the principles are expressed by later theosophists. The various presentations of the principles are important for a number of reasons. Firstly, it is of historical interest that different schematic systems were presented by H. P. Blavatsky. Secondly, in terms of the theosophical interpretive techniques, the subtle differences in the principles enable the theosophical engagement with the world's religions. 
by presenting various combinations of principles, the interpretive power is increased. The sevenfold basic principles are the foundation of other schemes which also delineate the human being. An example will be the Nirmanakaya, Sampagakaya and Dharmakaya Vestures 8 as interpreted by Theosophy, where the separate vestures are made up of different combinations of the various principles. There are many other terms associated with the delineation of the human being, and a glance through a theosophical dictionary will reveal an array of teachings around this topic. Two examples of this are the Sutratman and the Jivatman. The theosophical principles are, therefore, not set out in just one defined scheme. There are variations of the standard scheme, variations which are harnessed in theosophy's interpretive applications. The variations together have greater explanatory power and allow for greater flexibility in the interpretations of world religions. There is not a uniform progression, though, and various schemes can be present simultaneously in the later works of H. P. Blavatsky. This does present one potential complication in understanding statements made in the secret doctrine. A neutral term like shadow, unexplained in the text, may retrospectively be interpreted according to theosophical presentations which postdate the secret doctrine. The teachings in the esoteric instructions and inner group teachings postdate the secret doctrine. As the theosophical teachings evolved in complexity their ability to respond to external criticisms would have evolved too. Its attempts to respond to criticisms of their techniques would have increased their interpretive power that they were ultimately unsuccessful in gaining mainstream acceptances of historical interest. For the general purposes of this dissertation, I will use the basic division of Atman, Buddha, Manas, Kama, Prana, Linga Sarira, and Stula Sarira. I will stray from this only when H. P. Blavatsky does so in a specific extract which may be under discussion. The theosophical esoteric system accepts a sevenfold division of the individual and of Nature.9 The ontological status of these principles, and by extension the planes, is slightly ambiguous. The six lower principles are aspects of the one principle, Atman, which itself is rooted in the one principle of which all things are expressions. Atman itself also interpenetrates those principles below it. The six lower principles, still a sarira to Buddha, however, are not however totally illusory. They partake in some way of the divine reality which underlies all things. Practically they, all the principles, will become one only at the end of a great cycle, after which there will be a new re-embodiment. Ten, theosophy struggles with this concept macrocosmically in terms of conceptualizing how the various planes of existence relate to the one reality. Various concepts are evoked to explain the relationship, for example, the one reality radiates the lower planes. Radiate being used here in preference to emanate. Barbarka notes that the sevenfold principles denote the structure of the human being but not how the principles function in practicality. It is a theoretical structure in a living reality, but other presentations can be used in explaining the practical living functions of the individual. 1992, page 178, for example. Theosophy explains that the seven principles as configured cannot be separated without the individual dying, but when the individual is conceived in another manner separation is possible. Not just human beings, but plants, animals, the solar system, and galaxies can all be conceived of in the sevenfold manner. Everything in the theosophical conception is alive, and has life, and consciousness of some sort associated with it. Differentiating the plant from the animal. From the human is not a question of fundamental structure, but of evolution and consciousness. Levels. The awakening of the principles is associated with evolution and, potentially, initiation. Which is a hastened evolution. Each principle is also conceived of as being sevenfold. For example, the Manas principle will have an Atman aspect, a Buddha aspect, a mental aspect, and so on. The principles unfold from Atman downwards and their awakening is through the process of evolution. The principles of the individual can exist prior to their awakened 
functioning. Presently, humanity is said to be in its fourth round and fifth root race, meaning that the mental aspect of the Kama principles is being awakened. The full and true mental principle, Manus, of the human being will, evolutionarily speaking, only begin being awakened. Far in the future, there are different substances associated with each plane and with each principle. The consciousness side of nature is manifest through substances and matters appropriate to each plane. In a similar manner, the higher principles manifest on the lower planes through the lower principles. Below I outline some of the teachings associated with the human principles tabulated above. Atman, the highest self, universal. Sometimes it is translated as spirit. In the more esoteric teachings of H. P. Blavatsky it is not regarded strictly as a human principle. Eleven, the Oric Egg is substituted for this principle, i.e. the seventh principle. Atman is a universal principle, pure. Cosmic Consciousness in the Breath of the Absolute. The Zirkoff 1983, page 120, this principle is poetically described in the Mahatma letters as, when we speak of the seventh principle it is neither quality nor quantity nor yet form that are meant, but rather the space occupied in that ocean of spirit by the results or effects dash, impressed thereon. 1972, page 74 H. B. Blavatsky notes in a similar vein. It, Atma, seventh principle, is in metaphysics, that point in space which the human monad and its vehicle man occupy for the period of every life. 1987, page 117 in Theosophical Writings Atman and Buddha link during incarnation to form the monad which, with the higher monas, forms the higher self of the individual. Auric Egg, the term Auric Egg is not listed in the expanded index of the secret doctrine. It, is revealed in some detail in the esoteric instructions in the inner group teachings of H. P. Blavatsky, both of which works post-date the publication of the secret doctrine. It can often substitute for the Atman principle. Little is said about it, but it is conceived as containing in germ all the principles that make up the human individual. Pirocher 1969, page 15, The Auric Egg preserves the karmic record of an individual, is the source of the astral body of an individual, and acts as the storehouse of positive and negative thoughts of the person. Buddha, literally to enlighten or awaken. This is the higher discriminating and intuitional principle, and it suggests the innate spiritual knowledge inherent in the human being. It is spiritual consciousness manifesting as wisdom and direct knowledge of things. It is a vehicle for the Atmic principle, and it is associated with the higher conscience and spiritual discernment. Manas, the mental, thinking, reflective principle or body-slash-vehicle. It is the higher intellectual, indiscriminating, rational aspect of the mind. The center of the ego consciousness is located in this principle. It can be pulled downwards to the common principle to form the common manas, or lower and passionate mind, or drawn upwards towards Buddha to form the Buddha manas, the higher mind. Theosophically speaking this dual division of the mental principle is also referred to as the lower monas and the higher monas. The higher mind, also the individuality, is regarded as part of the enduring aspect of the person, the real person, which does not disintegrate at death. The lower mind, the personality, also the conscious, rational mind, does not survive death. The mind principle is the most complicated and theosophical literature. It is what separates us from the animal kingdom. In that kingdom the mental consciousness as we understand it is dormant and unawakened, but does exist in this latent state. The mysterious events which led to the awakening of mind in the human being, the descent of the Manasaputras is one of the central teachings of theosophy. Kama, the desire principle or body. This is the primary location of passions. These colorless propulsive energies are directed by the mind either downward towards the physical body or inward to the higher principles. The desires and passions, however, form an independent principle which too dissipates at death. They, the desires and passions, are not so. To speak aspects of the mind or the body, although in theosophical thought as each 
principle is sevenfold there would be a comma aspect to the mental principle, the kama rupa, or desire vehicle is a body where and after death the principles of the person reside. The higher principles are said to be barely conscious on this lower plane. These higher principles, separate from this temporary body, a second death, which also gradually dissipates. It is this. Kama Rupa which is one theosophical interpretation for the ghosts or spooks spoken of. Piraka writes that it is an exact astral duplicate, in appearance and mannerisms, of the man who died. It is idolin or image. 1969, page 77 Prana, the life principle, the vital body. The life force is an energy animating and permeating. The human being. This life principle exists in the cosmic sense as a universal principle of which. The pervasive prana in the human body is a portion. At death these energies return to that. Universal Source Barberka, 1992, page 189, Theosophical writers describe this body in Scientific terms, for example, psychoelectrical veil, psychoelectrical field and electromagnetic field. Barberka, 1992, Pirucker, 1969, this principle is also composed of life photons of its own class. These energies manifest in the body as vital currents, of which there are various systems of enumeration, 3, 5, sevenfold etc. Lingasarira, the pattern body, or astral body, composed of subtler matter, suggested to be electric and magnetic in nature, than the physical body, it is the model for the material, physical body, and precedes it. This astral form, which includes astral organs, nerves, and arteries, is a more permanent body than the physical body. The real sense organs are located within this astral body. At death, when the three higher principles withdraw into their spheres, this body survives for a greater or lesser time and slowly decays and disintegrates. It remains near the corpse until it dissipates. Judge, 1973 Page 47, this residual shell, which can retain much of the thoughts and memories of the deceased, is also thought to account for the ghost seen and like phenomena. This is not to say that there might not be other causes for ghosts and similar phenomenon put forward in theosophical literature, Barbarka explains that the Linga Sarira and the Kama Rupa can both be referred to as the astral body which can lead to some confusion. One difference between the two is that the former cannot leave the body until after death. 1992, page 191 Stula Sarira, this is the gross, coarser material body. The physical body includes the brain, nerves, blood, bones, lymph, muscles, and organs of sensation and skin. Judge 1973, PG. 37. It is the vehicle for the other six principles on this earth at this point in evolution. This principle, impermanent and subject to change, has no inherent sense of itself. Matter is composed of the cosmic elements, which in the theosophical conception is composed of life. Atoms. At death the natural process of decay ensues and the body disintegrates into the material kingdoms. It has been suggested by H. P. Blavatsky that the physical body has no importance in the more esoteric numerations of the human constitution. 12. See Table 3 above. For various presentations, this is an interesting point given the importance placed on the body. By the ancient Egyptians, this difference in attitude to the physical body is highlighted in the Theosophical philosophical preference to cremate the dead against the importance of the ancient. Egyptians placed on mummification. 4.3 The Egyptian principles as presented by H. P. Blavatsky. H. P. Blavatsky clearly indicates that the esoteric, theosophical, teachings of the seven principles constituting the individual can be found in the Egyptian religion. 13 In the secret doctrine, she writes No Eastern, Aryan, esoteric works are so far published, but we possess the Egyptian. Papyri which speak clearly of the seven principles or the seven souls of man. 1988. Volume 1, PG.226-7 We are warned, though, not to seek these analogies or concordances between the two systems, esoteric and exoteric, and the translations of our Orientalists. Lovatsky, 
BCW, Volume 10, Page 57 by affirming the distinction between esoteric, theosophical, and exoteric presentations, space, is being created for theosophical insertion and appropriation. It also indicates a lack of explicit supporting evidence for theosophical positions in the source material. She does not, however, engage in detail with any primary Egyptian text. Instead her statements on the Egyptian principles in the secret doctrine are cursory and, in the main, based on the secondary sources of Gerald Massey and Franz Lambert. She does quote from the Book of the Dead, but it is not a systematic engagement with this text, and, in some instances, her quotes appear to be drawn from indirect sources. An example of this is her extract on page 635 in Volume 1 of The Secret Doctrine. It is clear from the context of the passage that she is discussing the ideas of Gerald Massey in his article The Seven Souls of Man, but she makes no direct, independent reference to the Book of the Dead. Instead, she simply copies his extract. Word for Word.14 A review of the expanded index of the secret doctrine reveals that relatively little space is given to a discussion of the principles in the Egyptian religion, in The Secret Doctrine, H. P. Blavatsky's main work on this topic is contained in pages 630-641 to 641 of Volume 2 in a subsection, entitled, The Seven Souls of the Egyptologists, two articles in her collected works which discuss the Egyptian principles are, Theories about Reincarnation and Spirits, Volume 7, published originally in 1886, and The Psychology of Ancient Egypt found in Volume 10 the article being published originally in 1888. There is also brief mention made in Isis Unveiled, published 1877, of the Egyptian divisions constituting a human being. I will review her statements in chronological order. In Isis Unveiled, published in 1877, H. P. Blavatsky writes, In the Egyptian notions, as in those of all their faiths founded on philosophy, man was not merely as with the Christians, a union of soul and body, he was a trinity when spirit was added to it. Besides, that doctrine made him consist of ka, body, kaba, astral, form, or shadow, ka, animal soul or life principle, ba, the higher soul, and okdash, terrestrial intelligence. They had also a sixth principle named sa, or mummy, but the functions of this one commenced only after the death of the body. 1988, Volume 2, page 367-15. This is an interesting passage for two reasons. Firstly, she does not specifically mention the Egyptians having a sevenfold division of the individual. She does not seem at any pains to locate a sevenfold division of the human constitution at this point in her literary career. She does, however, Mention a threefold division.16 this relates to one of the accusations leveled against H. P. Blavatsky, namely that the sevenfold division is a later thought of hers. Her response was that it was not given to her to reveal the sevenfold division at that point in time. 17. This expansion of the threefold division is only in six at this point. As explained by H. P. Blavatsky in The Secret Doctrine, in the reference in footnote 16 below, the seventh is the Synthesis of the Six Principles Secondly, as we will see below, the correspondences offered do not tally precisely with later presentations. Related to this is that the order as stated does not seem, theosophically speaking, quite correct. If the order is correct, it lists the higher soul, Ba, below the terrestrial intelligence, Ak, and makes the saw higher than both, below. Here signifying more material and higher signifying more spiritual, it is not entirely clear, however, that she is concerned with listing these aspects in any order. In 1877 the Theosophical Principles, Upman, Buddha, Manas, etc., had not been revealed, so there could be no attempt to correlate the concepts of the Egyptian to Theosophical ideas. The importance of ordering and classification would not be paramount in this context. Writing in 1886 in an article, Theories About Reincarnation and Spirit, she notes, Old Egyptians in the Neoplatonists thought on the subject, they divided man into 
Three principal groups subdivided into principles as we do, pure immortal spirit, the spectral soul, a luminous phantom, and the gross material body. Apart from the latter which was considered as the terrestrial shell, these groups were divided into six. Principles, one, ka, vital body, two, kaba, astral form, or shadow, three, ku, animal, soul, four, ak, terrestrial intelligence, five, sa, the divine soul, or Buddha, and six, sa, or mummy, the functions of which began after death. Osiris was the highest uncreated spirit, for it was, in one sense, a generic name, every man becoming after his translation. Osirified, I absorbed into Osiris' son with a glorious divine state. 1975, page 189-190 in a footnote in the article, H. V. Blavatsky places these in parallel with the theosophical teachings. I tabulate them for convenience. I have inverted the order from that in the text for the sake of consistency, and the numbers in the left column are to be ignored. Table 4, Egyptian and Theosophical Principles 7. Saw Mummy or Body 6. Kapranatma, Vital Principle 5. Kabbalinga Sarira 4. Kakama Rupa, Seed of Terrestrial Desires 3. Akmanis 2. Sa 18 Buddha 1. Osiris Atma Blavatsky, BCW Volume 7, page 190 in the written extract The gross material body is not part of the six principles listed. In the footnote, reflected in Table 4, the saw slash mummy are correlated with the body. There is no mention of the Ba principle, and one might suspect that this mention was, perhaps, meant to be the Ba. Between 1877, Isis unveiled, and 1886, the theosophical system had been established and the processes of interpretation and appropriation had begun. The order and classification is now more important as H. P. Blavatsky begins to seek authority over texts and traditions. By 1888 her orientation to this topic seems to have changed. The Secret Doctrine, published in that year, presented two sets of correspondences which I have redrawn into one table, I have. Inverted the order of the Kabbalah and hieroglyphics columns to keep like principles in parallel. Table 5, Egyptian and Theosophical Correspondences From the Secret Doctrine Column 1, Column 2, Column 3, Column 4, Column 5 Esoteric, Indian Egyptian Kabbalah Hieroglyphics 1. Rupa, Body or Element of Form Ka, Body Goof Chat, The Elementary body. 2. Prana, the breath of life. Ba, the soul of breath. Coach ha goof anch, vital. Force, archaeus. Colon mamiya. 3. Astral body kaba, the shade. Nefish ka, the astral body, evistrum. Colon sidereal man. 4. Kama, rupa, or Animal soul. Aku. Intelligence or. Perception. Ruach abhadi the. Heart. Feeling. Animal soul. Five manas. Or. Intelligence. Seb. Ancestral. Soul. Nishima bay. Intellectual. Soul. The. Intelligence. Six Buddha. Spiritual. Soul. Puta. The first. Intellectual. Father. Chaya Shaibi. Spiritual soul. Seven Atma, pure spirit Atma, a divine. Or eternal soul. Jeshida Chu, divine. Spirit. Extracted from the Secret Doctrine, 1988, Volume 2, page 632-633, columns 2 and 3 are drawn from a lecture by Gerald Massey, The Seven Souls of Man and their culmination in the Christ, published in 1887. Gerald Massey is discussing an early theosophical publication, Esoteric Buddhism written by A.P. Sinnott. Columns 4 and 5 are consolidated by H.P. Blavatsky from journal articles by Franz Lambert. H.P. Blavatsky presents the Egyptian principles and correspondence to the theosophical 
Principles There is no actual discussion of the principles in the text. It is mainly a correspondence based on functionality, although there is an element of a structural relationship based on the number 7. The location of the 7 principles in the Egyptian teachings is important for H. P. Blavatsky as it allows for the interpretation and insertion of the theosophical content into the Egyptian system. It is relevant to note that H. P. Blavatsky does not appear to present her own correspondence of principles between Egypt and Theosophy. Fully, she presents instead the work of Gerald Massey and Franz Lambert and then comments on and amends them. The table of correspondences presented in The Secret Doctrine was briefly commented on in 1892 in the Theosophical Magazine, Lucifer. The editor, presumably, writes in a review of books. And The Secret Doctrine, too. 632, 633, H. P. B. gives Gerald Massey's list, in which the Ka does not occur, and also the list of Franz Lambert from the Sphinx, who identifies the Ka with the Kabbalistic Nepesh, HBB herself abstains from endorsing either category or giving esoteric correspondences, and simply cites these authors to show that the division was septenary. 20. The reviewer, seemingly unable to correlate the statements, suggests that the point of the tables is simply to highlight the sevenfold division in ancient Egypt and not to state actual theosophical correspondences to Egyptian terms. This is, in part, confirmed by H. P. Blavatsky who, remarking on Lambert's work, writes that This is a very fair representation of the number of the principles of occultism, but Much confused, and this is what we call the seven principles in man, and what Mr. Massey Calls souls. But how can Ruach, Spirit, be lodged in Kama Rupa? 1988, Volume 2, P.G. 635 While there may be some truth in this perspective, it does not, however, seem entirely justified. The corrective footnote H. P. Blavatsky appends to Massey's tabulation suggests that she is expressing, at least in part, the esoteric teachings, as she adopts Massey's terms of Sep, Puta, and Atmu, however, which are not normally mentioned as aspects of the individual, it is difficult to assess. Mention should be made of the last three principles mentioned by Massey, column 3. The term Seb, Puta and Atmu have puzzled me until I looked up the reference in Massey's lecture, The Seven Souls of Man. In particular, the last two terms were curious to me. It seemed amazing that there was an Egyptian term Atma which was both the seventh principle and mirrored the Asian Atma or Aban. In fact, however, Gerald Massey elaborates on these two terms in his lecture. Referring to Puta, he writes, that was as the new of the Gnostics, the revealer of an intellectual soul, who in Egypt is the god Puta, or Puta, the opener, whom I elsewhere identify with Buddha in India. 1992, page 230. Puta is then identified as the god. Puta. For the term Atma, the seventh soul, Massey writes, Atma is equivalent to the Buddhist Atma, the creative soul. 1992, page 230. For Atma we can read Atom, the Egyptian deity. Seb, too, is one of the cosmic deities. Massey then, for all three higher theosophical principles, List cosmic deities as correspondences and not Egyptian human aspects. It is my contention that, if H. P. Blavatsky, or another authorized individual, does not pronounce on an issue, for example correspondences between principles, no statement of the ancient wisdom tradition will exist. Later theosophical writers will present opinions, and very likely contradictory ones, which reflect the uncertainty and lack of definitiveness in the Base material, the writings of H. P. Blavatsky. 4.3.1 Selected Readings In this section I extract and discuss representative readings from H. P. Blavatsky's writings, which refer to the topic of the human constitution as presented in the Egyptian religion. 4.3.1.1 Reading 1 H. P. Blavatsky writes, The Book of the Dead gives a complete list of the transformations that every defunct undergoes, while divesting himself, one by one, 
of all those principles, materialize for the sake of clearness into ethereal entities or bodies. 1988, Volume 1, page 227 H. B. Blavatsky is alluding here to a well-known belief of the ancient Egyptians. In the transformation spells of the Book of the Dead, the deceased expresses the desire and hope to transform into various entities, including birds, crocodiles, a god, etc. The desire for the Transformed states expresses the desire for freedom the deceased hopes to attain in the afterlife. H. P. Blavatsky interprets the transformations as representing the changes undergone by the deceased during the process of dying. The principles, Linga Sarira, Stula Sarira, etc., are shed in an orderly manner. They are materialized, she notes, for the sake of clearness. Bye. Indicating that, that the Egyptian principles are materialized, she opens a space for the insertion of theosophical content. The inner principles and theosophical contention are not material. Materialized, and their presentation as such in Egyptian text needs to be explained. H. P. Blavatsky also alludes here to a theme that she will carry through in her writings on Egypt, viz. that the process of dying involves the shedding of the lower principles, an idea foreign to the Egyptians. 4.3.1.2 Reading 2 H. P. Blavatsky touches on this theme of the sevenfold divisions of the individual in the passage. In the secret doctrine, the shadow, the astral form, is annihilated, devoured by the Uraeus, Xlix, 51, the manes will be annihilated, the two twins, the fourth and fifth principles, will be scattered, but the soul bird, the divine swallow, and the Uraeus of flame, Manus and Atma Buddha, will live in the eternity, for they are their mother's husbands. 1988, Volume 1, P.G. 227 references made to Chapter 149 of the Book of the Dead. The translation by Davis of Chapter 149, 50-52 reads, O oh, this dwelling of the hour, this dwelling of the hour in Ristau, the burning flame at, which do not arrive the gods, and which do not assemble the shades, for there are there. Uraeus for the annihilating of their souls. O oh, this dwelling of the hour! I am there as a hawk, as the chief of the shades. I am there among the wandering stars. My name shall not perish. 1894, page 175, Allen translates the same passage as O oh, thou mound, of, when it, suburb of rose thou, whose scorching breath is fire, the Gods ascend not to her nor do the bless unite with her, and the cobras upon her are. Each, named, destroyer, O thou mound, of, when it, I am the greatest of the. Bless that are in thee, I am with the imperishable stars that are in thee. I have not. Perished, my name has not perished. 1974, page 145 chapter 149 of the Book of the Dead is a description of the netherworld field of rushes. This is a domain of Osiris through which the deceased must pass by having certain knowledge and passwords. The extracts are from the description of Mound 12, of 14 in this chapter, but 15 in chapter 150. The general theosophical sense of the passage from the secret doctrine is the dissipation of the lower principles, the shadow, the manies and the two twins, during death. I find it is Difficult to assign precise theosophical correspondences to these principles. It appears to be Shadow, Astral Body, Manis, Kama Rupa, Fourth and Fifth Principles, Lower Manas and Kama. The Three Higher Principles, the Divine Swallow and Uraeus of Flame Dash identified as Manas and Amma Buddha and the Extract will, however, remain intact following death. In Theosophical Teachings the three higher principles are the true person, the individuality which is immortal. The Theosophical Glossary further suggests that Uraeus has a reference to initiation and secret. Wisdom. As death and initiation mirror each other in Theosophical thought, the intent of the passage remains unchanged. In another place, the secret doctrine identifies the Uraeus with the primordial vital principles in the sun which devours the lower principles of the deceased. 1988, Volume 2, page 674 Lurker in his dictionary, makes the Uraeus a symbol of kingship worn by the gods and the Pharaoh. 
It was represented as a rearing cobra worn on the head. 1980, page 125, This Serpent Avoided evil and was associated with the sun god Ra. One theosophical reading would be that of referring to the pharaoh as an initiate. In essence then, from the theosophical perspective, the passage deals with the dissipation of the four lower principles at death, while the three higher permanent principles enter into their afterlife states, for example, the Devachan. 4.3.1.3 Reading 3 H.P. Blavatsky does not approach this theme only by way of tables of correspondences and synonyms. Another way in which the Theosophical Sevenfold System is inserted into Egyptian texts, which in turn are then appropriated by the Theosophical System, is through the use of structural similarity in relation to the sevenfold theosophical principles in the Egyptian religion. We can see this in H. B. Blavatsky's identification of certain numerical sequences and teams with the seven principles. In the Secret Doctrine, discussing a verse of the stanzas of Zian which refers to the three-tongued flame of the four wicks, she comments, The three-tongued flame that never dies is the immortal spiritual triad, the Atma Buddha and Manas, the fruition of the latter assimilated by the first two after every terrestrial life. The four wicks that go out and are extinguished are the four lower principles, including the body. I am the three wicked flame and my wicks are immortal, says the defunct. I enter into the domain of Sekum, the god whose arm sows the seed of action produced by the disembodied soul, and I enter the region of the flames who have destroyed their adversaries, i.e., got rid of the sin creating four wicks. See Chap. I. 7. Book of the Dead, and the Mysteries of Rostan, Blavatsky, 1988, Volume 1, page 237 In this passage, the relatively neutral terms of flames in the wicks are correlated to the Theosophical Principles. It is a relationship based on the number 7 and its associated Concepts, 3 Enduring Higher Principles and 4 Temporary Lower Principles. Through this Interpretive Maneuver, Egyptian teachings are shown to mirror the ancient wisdom teachings of theosophy, and Egyptian texts and concepts are thereby appropriated. I have attempted to follow up the references given by H. P. Blavatsky to the Book of the Dead. And the mysteries of Rose Stand.21 the latter I believe has not been identified and is seen to be a secret book not available to the public. With regards to the former, the Book of the Dead. Chapter 1, Verse 7 I have not found any sentence corresponding to the first sentence though. The funct is said to utter. I am the three wicked flame and my wicks are immortal, this is. Presumably the extract from the mysteries of Rostan. The following quotation seems to be a version, or paraphrase, of a verse from the first chapter of. The Book of the Dead which Davis renders as. I am with Horus in the act of supporting this left arm of the Osiris who is in Sekum, I. Go out and enter the blazing abode, exterminating the opponents, in other words, the Rebels in Sekum. 1894, page 6970 Allen renders the passage, chapter 1, verses 3 in his work, as I was with Horus on the day of wrapping the dismembered one and opening the pits, of washing the weary-hearted one and secreting the entrance to the secrets in Rosedow. I was with Horus as savior of that left shoulder of Osiris that was in. Metopolis, going into and out of the devouring flame on the day of expelling the rebels from Letopolis. 1974, page 5 chapter 1 of the Book of the Dead was recited by a priest at the head of the funeral procession, leading the deceased to their tomb. The Egyptian texts are referencing the myth of Osiris. Osiris was dismembered, his parts scattered over Egypt, and then saved by Horus and others. The priest is assuring the deceased that he can assist them as Thoth and Horus had assisted. Osiris. The enemies, rebels, of Osiris are Seth and his confederates. The dismembered. Parts of Osiris were scattered over Egypt, and it was in Latopolis, Sekum, Sekum, that the left arm of Osiris was deposited. In an important theosophical interpretive technique, H. P. Blavatsky has internalized and Psychologize the Osiris myth. In this theosophical context Osiris and Horus together. 
representing the higher self of an individual gets rid of the four wicks or the lower self. The region of the flames could be seen as the inner planes, and flames as spiritual beings of certain category. Secondly, the theosophical reading is the Devachan, which, when conceived of as a locality, is associated with the inner, more spiritual planes. See the secret. Doctrine, Volume 1, page 220 where this is clarified. I will discuss it in more detail in the following. Chapter 4.3.1.4 Reading 4 In Volume 7 of her collected works H.P. Blavatsky writes, Now what was the coup? Simply the astral body, or the aerial simulacrum of the corpse or the mummy, that which in China is called the Huan, and in India the boot. 1975, page 106 in the same article the term Ku is referenced in another passage in H. P. Blavatsky's Collected Works, Volume 7, of the kiss two kinds were distinguished. First, the justified kiss, i.e., those who had been absolved from sin by Osiris when they were brought before his tribunal. Those lived a second life. Secondly, there were the guilty kiss, the kiss that a second time, these were the damned. Second death did not annihilate them, but they were doomed to wander about and to torture people. Their existence had phases. Analogous to those of the living man, a bond so intimate between the dead and the living that one sees how the observation of religious funeral rites and exorcisms and prayers, or rather magic incantations, should have become necessary. 1975, p. g. 115. 622. This aspect of the coup is further elaborated in a later article in Volume 7 in H. P. Blavatsky's Collected Works where after describing the spiritual state of an Osiris she then outlines its opposite state. It was coup, but the lower portions of Ak or Kama Rupa with the additions of the dregs of Manus remaining all behind in the astral light of our atmosphere, that formed the counterparts of the terrible and so much dreaded poots of the Hindus, our Elementaries. 1975, page 190 she continues. There were two kinds of kiss, the justified ones, who after living for a short time a second life, numb on, faded out, disappeared, and those kiss who were condemned to wandering without rest and darkness after dying for a second time, moot, m, nom dash, and who were called the home eater, second time dead, which did not prevent them from clinging to a vicarious life after the manner of vampires. 1975, page 190 The sense of these passages is the equating of the ku with the theosophical kama rupa. The kama rupa is not the theosophical kama principle. As an interpretive technique the flexibility and complexity of the theosophical system facilitates its insertion into a wide variety of religious texts. The Kama or Desire Principle is the fourth principle in the individual's constitution. The Kama Rupa is a vehicle or body assumed by the deceased following death. Prior to the entering of the Devachan, the deceased experiences a second death, from this state, and enters the Devachan. The Kama Rupa shell may remain behind but will in time disintegrate. Extremely evil individuals may endure in this Kama Rupa state for long periods of time, either delay their entrance into the more spiritual states. Of interest is G. De Piruckers. Note to the effect that, the Kama Rupa is an exact astral duplicate in appearance and mannerisms, of the man who died, it is his idolon or image. 1933, page 86, this is suggestive in terms of the Egyptian description of the various aspects, or modes of being, of the Individual deceased, for example, the shadow, ka, or ba, etc. These passages are important for another reason. And then H. B. Blavatsky makes a distinction between the ku and the ak, suggesting that they are separate aspects. I will discuss this in more detail further on in this chapter, but of relevance is that some later theosophists equate the ku with the ak, that is, they are synonyms, while, in some of H. B. Blavatsky's writings. On this topic, all reference to the coup is dropped. and the secret doctrine itself the correspondences are no clearer. In Table 5 in the Column 2 and 3 H. B. Blavatsky makes the Kama Rupa correspond to Aku, 
while minus corresponds to Seb. In column 4 and 5 it is Shaibi corresponding to Buddha, while Chu corresponds to Atma. Godfrey de Pirucker, in his encyclopedic theosophical glossary, makes the coup, coup and Aku synonyms. 4.3.1.5 Reading 5 In various places H.P. Blavatsky will read Osiris as a synonym for the Agnan principle. As one example, from her collected works volume 14, she states, The seventh principle being of course the highest, uncreated spirit was generically called Osiris, therefore every deceased person became Osirified, or an Osiris, after death. 1985 Page 381 in this passage, Osiris, is both a synonym for the Admic principle, and, like the terms Buddha, and Christ, becomes a title. Generally speaking any person could become a Buddha or a Christ, or an Osiris, after successfully undergoing one of the higher initiations, or after completing the path of human evolution of the seven rounds and seven races. The state would normally be achieved through self-conscious effort during life, that is, initiation. The simple act of dying would not translate a person into the Buddha or Christ status, irrespective though of whether one became an Osiris following death or after initiation, H. P. Blavatsky elaborates on the issue by noting in her collected works, Volume 7, the reader need not be told that every soul newly born into its cycle of 3,000 years after the death of the body it animated, became, in Egypt, and Osiris, was Osirified, viz. The personality became reduced to its higher principles, a spirit. 1975, page 94 The individual, casting off the lower principles, is reduced to his higher principles. It should be noted that the theosophical teachings surrounding Osiris are very much broader than simply this identification. I am focusing specifically here on the interpretations surrounding the human individual. For Egyptologists becoming Osiris referred to the deceased identifying with the resurrection of Osiris. The deceased, as Osiris, hoped and expected to be reborn and live again in the afterlife. The deceased conquered death by mirroring the pattern of the Osiris myth. 4.4 The Human Constitution in Contemporary Egyptology in this section I outline the mainstream academic perspective on the Egyptian individual. I will relate and contextualize the academic opinion against the theosophical views as outlined above. I will not present an historical survey of the academic view on this topic. I am interested in the general, current academic perspective. The academic community would, in principle, have no issue with an evolution and understanding and interpretation from earlier to later studies. As new texts are uncovered, new translations made, and more resources are directed towards a subject, an evolving of ideas may be expected. The theosophical presentation cannot, however, engage in a topic in the same open-ended manner. It will always approach a topic from its conclusion, from the truth of it. For Theosophists, the initiates of the past have solved all the mysteries of nature, for our solar system at the very least, and their conclusions have been checked and verified by later adepts. The theosophical presentation on a topic will be that of finality and factuality. No amendment to a theosophical statement of authority can be accepted unless further appeals to authority, or other coping mechanisms, are invoked. While patent errors, mainly in the form of misquotations or misreferencing, can be admitted. Doctrinal statements are not easily subject to a process of correction. Witness a note on the seven principles in the Egyptian religion by Boris de Zirkoff in his 1972 edition of Isis Unveiled. Egyptologists differ among themselves in regard to this subject. Many points remain uncertain in the interpretation of hieroglyphic texts. Some have pointed out the Following sequence of constituent portions of man, 1. Kot, physical body, 2. Sahu dash. The kot transformed by mummification, 3. Ka, the double, also material soul, 4. Ba, the soul, 5. Ak, glorified spirit, 6. Kabit, the shadow, 7. Ren, the name, 8. 
Sekum, the power, nine. Ebb, the heart, or conscience. Lovatsky, 1972, Volume 2, PG. 653 pointing out the potential discrepancy between H. B. Blavatsky's statements and the academic position, recourse is made to differences of opinion between Egyptologists. While it is true that Egyptologists point to difficult and imperfectly understood aspects of the Egyptian religion, insider differences of opinion over theosophical doctrines are not really possible as they are. Based on sources of authority not easily challenged.23 The history of the engagement of Egyptologists with the ancient Egyptian religion in no way mirrors the theosophical engagement. Within Egyptology there are various schools of thought and an interpretation on many of the Egyptian themes. There are changes in understanding over time, based on further texts and resources being made available. In theosophical thought, the beginning is the end in a real sense. Any differences over time need to be explained away with the coping. Mechanisms I have outlined before. In a sense, theosophical writers attempt to uncover the meaning in the writings of H. B. Blavatsky and other key authorities in much the same way as Egyptologists try to recover meaning in the Egyptian texts. A subsidiary reason for the theosophical concepts being in some ways less problematic and in principle better defined is that we possess the voluminous writings of H. B. Blavatsky which explicitly work out specific meanings. We are, however, not really privy to the internal debates and thought life of the Egyptians of two to four thousand years ago. My point is that one reason Egyptian concepts are more difficult to grasp as opposed to theosophical teachings is that, with the latter, we have detailed explanatory works by the founder. Lacking these explanatory and philosophical works, Egyptologists need to work harder to reconstruct the intended meaning of concepts in ancient Egypt. The lack of explicit definitions in Egyptian sources makes any final conclusion more elusive in the academic field. There is a conceptual issue raised here concerning the process of comparison. Is comparison possible? If so, how is comparison between traditions facilitated? R.B. Finistad has raised this issue in relation to ancient Egypt in his important article on transposing soul and body into a monistic conception of being, an example from ancient Egypt. 1986, the academic study of comparative religion grew out of a Western Christian background. Terms such as soul, body, spirit and God have become standard reference points. They are, however, Terms loaded with specific Western and Christian meaning and associations. If these terms are to be retained, their use in reference to non-Western religions needs to be carefully defined too. Avoid misrepresentations. The academic community has retained these terms, but it is careful to contextualize their use and meaning in specific interpretive settings. Fenesto displays the analytical use of these loaded terms in the very foreign context of the Egyptian religion. Egypt does not display the same dualistic and compartmentalized presentation of the human individual as is common in Western speculation. I will discuss the Egyptian conceptions below. Suffice it to note at this point that theosophical interpretation involves no such subtlety. 4. Theosophists, foreign religions are molded into mirror images of the theosophical statement. This is inevitable in the theosophical process of interpretation owing to its conception of the origin of religions in the nature of the human engagement with nature as it is. While it is not the thrust of my work, it might be worth noting that this lack of subtlety no doubt characterized early academic comparative studies of religion. The theosophical method, however, has not, and, perhaps, is not, capable of correcting this. It follows, then, that before discussing the basic aspects of the individual, the overall Egyptian, Conception of the human being as a complete entity needs to be outlined. I intend to follow. The dominant mainstream presentation on this theme here. There would be debates presented. Within the field of Egyptian studies which would be beyond the scope of this dissertation. Outlining the overall conception of the individual is important, as many Egyptologists suggest. That ancient Egyptians did not conceive of the individual in the same manner as Greek and. 
Western philosophical and religious thought did. It the fundamental Egyptian conception of the individuals radically different from theosophical views than the theosophical program of correspondence and correlation becomes difficult to sustain. The process of correlating and locating synonyms for terms requires the underlying conceptions to be similar. On a fundamental level, at the category level, there must be some basic structural and functional similarity. If category level correspondence is not apparent, then the process of correlating becomes an artificial one of total revision and reconstruction. The violence done to Egyptian concepts is such that Egyptian thoughts are no longer actually engaged in. They are simply ignored and replaced by theosophical categories and content. It must be noted here that this discussion will focus on the various modes of being of the individual as they manifest after death. The aspects of the individual as in if they exist during an individual's life will form only a subsidiary part of the review. Underlying the theosophical program of correspondences is a conception of the individual, which is made up of parts. Each part has specific functions, characteristics, and larger associations. The full human being is composed of all seven parts. In fact, all things, beings, and non-human objects are composed of the seven principles. While the parts may not, under certain circumstances, be practically separable, they are theoretically and philosophically separable. A forceful statement of the Egyptian conception of the human being is by Louis V. Zabkarin. His work, A Study of the Ball Concept in Ancient Egyptian Texts, 1968-24 in this work Zabkar is critical of attempts to resolve the Egyptian conception of the individual into the body, soul, and spirit dynamic of Greek and Western thought. Zabkar repeatedly argues that the Egyptians did not view the individual in dichotomous, trichotomous or tetrachotomous terms. There was no dualistic conception of the physical body in opposition to the spiritual soul. It is However, relevant to note that he concedes that there have been Egyptologists who have mistakenly viewed the different concepts of the Egyptians in this very sense often translating. So for the Ba apostrophe.25 at the end of his work, Zabkar himself determines the term Ba to be untranslatable into English, there being simply no equivalent concept available. 1968 Page 163 Finistad retains the use of soul and body in the context of Egyptian thought. The definition of these words, however, purposefully strays from their usual connotations. For the ancient Egyptians a person is a unit of qualities that can be specified as spiritual and material, and this unit belongs in its entirety to the terrestrial world. 1986, PG.361, the individual is to be conceived of as a unit which, as a complete entity, can be expressed as a body or a ka or a but etc. Each of these modes of being are conceptualized as complete spiritual and material units. The body, in this interpretive sense of the word, implies, for example, the complete person, including emotions, feelings, etc. The individual can be translated into other complete representations, for example the ka or ba or ak. Each represents the total person. The use of the word soul then signifies not the spiritual aspects of an individual which are separate from the body. Soul in this context refers to the ability of the whole individual to transcend his usual existence into a new type of existence after death. This new existence transcends conventional existence, but does not imply a new spiritual existence. The new forms, the ka, ba, etc. are spiritual and material units representing the entire individual. They are new. Modes of being of the complete person. Zabkar is at pains to stress his opposition to the conception of the human in terms of a dualistic body and soul. His monistic conception suggests that the deceased could exist in various shifting modes of being of which the ka, ba, and ak etc. are examples. 1963, PG.61, these are not to be conceived of as separate parts of the individual, but rather as each representing the totality of the individual's physical and psychic capacities. 1968, page 3, the Ba, 
4. Example as the complete individual was one of the forms in which the deceased lived in the afterlife. The ancient Egyptians did not have a concept of an internal spiritual soul which left the body at death, separating from the body. Instead, the deceased could live in a variety of forms, each of which was the entire person himself. The modes of existence included the physical and psychic features of the individual. The ba, ka, etc. is then the actual person himself, his personified alter ego which exists in the afterlife as a physical and psychic entity. There is a phrase in Egyptian text discussed by Zabkar which is useful to examine here as it quoted in some theosophical writings as proof of the body-slash-spirit duality. Oderberg and Wallens and their Egyptian teachings in the light of theosophy note, the quotation that follows best conveys the meaning of the kat, thine essence is in heaven, the kat is in the earth. 1941, page 439, they do not give a reference for this phrase, it is, however, well, attested in various forms in Egyptian text. The theosophical reading of this expression would be that after death the body remains on earth eventually decaying, while the soul withdraws into the inner planes, the devachan, god world, or has never left the higher planes, for example. The Atman Principle this phrase seems to support a dualistic conception of the human being. Zabkar agrees that various expressions in Egyptian texts have been used to support a dualistic interpretation of the individual. 26 These includes phrases like, Akraba to heaven, corpse to the underworld, a spell to remove the ba from the corpse, and heaven to thy ba, the underworld to thy corpse, and so on. He challenges, however, the dualistic interpretation for Various reasons. Zabkar notes firstly that the destination of the Ba or Ak was not only heaven. The Ba or Ak could also go to the underworld, or to earth. 1968, page 112, the Ba could also visit the favorite places of the deceased on earth, or join the corpse of the deceased. 1968, pg. 131, the sense of the phrase is that of total freedom of movement. Secondly, the expression. To remove the Ba from the corpse meant to make it emanate from the corpse, that is, to bring it into existence. In this context it illustrates one of the speculations of ancient Egyptians on the origin of the Ba. In opposition to this expression are spells to keep the Ba from departing from the body, i.e. to make it rest upon the body. 1968, page 111, partial explanation for the Different destinations of the Ba of the deceased has to do with the mixing of the solar doctrines surrounding the god Ra, and the underworld of siren elements of the Egyptian religion. This conception of the individual as a monistic entity capable of various complete representations after death is at odds with the theosophical view of the individual as a composite of seven parts which have different postmortem destinies. The Theosophical Conception is further resolvable into the threefold conception of body, stula sarira, linge zarira, prana, soul, kama, manas, and spirit, Buddha and Atman. Many theosophical tables of correspondence show just this resolution as an expansion from the three into seven principles. I find it hard to understate the negative implications for the theosophical. Interpretive endeavor that this monistic concept of the human individual entails. Firstly, the postmortem actions of the deceased have no resemblance to theosophical teachings of the disintegration of the lower principles, and, secondly, the various correspondences within the theosophical teachings are undermined. On the second point, the different human principles are linked to a wide variety of theosophical teachings on planetary chains human root races, and so on. If this correspondence breaks down, the entire theosophical edifice will be at odds with itself. The passage of the Zirkoff quoted earlier is useful as it introduces the academic division of the human individual. Bearing in mind the monistic background of the Egyptian presentation, I will outline each aspect in turn and discuss them in relation to the theosophical principles where possible. Following the order of Budge 27 for convenience, the following components are identified. 
4.4.1 The Body in the Mummy The physical and perishable body was called the cot. Budge, 1977, PG. Licks, Ikram notes that. Different words were used to represent the body in its different stages, cat for the living body, cot designating a corpse, and saw for designating the mummy. 2003, page 2324, Taylor goes into more detail on his death in the afterlife in ancient Egypt. He notes cat, form, in Eru. Appearance, for the living body, cot for the UN mummified or embalmed body, in specific. To the embalmed body, tut mummy or image, and saw which latter refers to a body which has been ritually prepared for the afterlife. 2001, page 17 Egyptologists agree on the importance of the ritually prepared or mummified body for the continuing existence in the afterlife. The saw was seen to be especially prepared eternal and idealized body the function of which was to form a physical base for the non-physical, though still corporeal, ba and ka. This body was one important link between the non-physical aspects of the deceased individual and the earth. Periodical visits by these non-physical aspects to the entomb mummy were offerings of various sorts, including food and magical writings, were placed, were essential to continued existence in the afterlife. These Egyptian terms ket and kot correspond to the theosophical body or stula serira. I I'm not aware of theosophical writings making any distinction between the alive and dead body. Corpse. The saw has no specific correspondence in the theosophical teachings that I can. Locate. The difference in emphasis between the theosophical and Egyptian teachings in. Relation to the physical body are marked. I will discuss in more detail in the following chapter. The process of disembodiment, death, and its relation to mummification, but, at this point, a. Few general notes can be made. An Isis unveiled a cryptic remark is made in relation to the saw. H.P. Blavatsky writes. They also had a sixth principle named saw, or mummy, but the functions of this one commenced only after the death of the body. After due purification, during which the soul, separated from its body, continued to revisit the latter in a mummified condition. This astral soul became a god for it was finally absorbed into the soul of the world. Lovatsky, 1988, Volume 2, page 367 It is not explained what the function of the mummy could have been in theosophical terms. The saw, the ritually transformed body of the deceased, was an important part of Egyptian. Funerary Beliefs I can think of no reference to the ritual preparation of the body of the deceased in theosophical literature. In the broader theosophical teachings on death and the afterlife, the physical body, or vehicle of the inner principles, plays no further role once it is cast off during the process of dying. I will discuss the theosophical view of mummification in ancient Egypt in an appendix. In this section I am concerned with the saw as a principle of the individual in the writings of H. P. Blavatsky. What is the equivalent theosophical principle of the saw? Thus far, for H. P. Blavatsky, the saw appears to be associated with the mummy in the body. A prominent later theosophist, Godfrey de Pirucker, however, in his encyclopedic theosophical glossary suggests that the saw who was roughly equivalent to the theosophical reincarnating ego, Oderberg, and Welm suggests that the saw who may correspond to the theosophical Nirmankaya. Concept. 1941, page 438, in general, and theosophical thought and adept in the Nirmanakaya. State or vesture consists of all the usual human principles except the physical body, discarded in the common principle, desire having been eliminated by the adept in the spiritual state. Lovatsky, 1990, page 231. It is difficult to reconcile the two later theosophical perspectives with each other, and with H. V. Blavatsky's initial statement. One potential reason for the Discrepancy between later theosophical views and H. P. Blavatsky's own presentation is that as the field of Egyptology advanced it became more difficult to stand by the underdeveloped statements of the founder. 4.4.2 The Ka Budge translates Ka as double. 1977, P.G. Licks, Ikram gives double or life force as general. Meanings for Ka 
2003, page 26, theoretically astral double and life force, vital energy would be two separate principles in the theosophical scheme. 28 Taylor notes the complexity surrounding the term and does not think a direct English translation is possible. He further notes that the Egyptian use of the term was not consistent or uniform over time. 2001, page 18 from the theosophical perspective, any fundamental change in usage over time resulting in basic changes in meaning would be explained away by the esoteric slash exoteric paradigm in the notion of further revelation. Ao Bolshakov, in his Man and His Double, in Egyptian Ideology of the Old Kingdom, outlines the historical debates within Egyptology over this complex idea. I will outline part of his historical survey and then examine his perspective on concept of the Ka. He covers a period of primary theories in which the main lines of interpretation were first suggested. Some lines of inquiry have been carried forward into the present, some have been abandoned. In brief summary, Bolshakov proposes four basic primary approaches to the concept of the Ka. The first line, exemplified by Maspero, 1893, conceptualizes the Ka as an exact copy of the person, a double, but still a physical entity of a type of matter. It is born with the person and is embodied in statues. A pager Neuf conceives of the Ka in terms of the Roman genius, a sort of spiritual double. 1997, page 124, the second line of interpretation saw the Ka as an individual's genius, with no relation to the tomb statues and murals. W.B. Christensen saw the Ka in terms of a person's personified vital force. 1997, page 125, the third line of interpretation represented by Erwin, 1906, suggested the Ka was a non-material force which distinguishes living beings from non-living objects. 1997, page 125, the fourth school, represented by A. Wiedemann, 1890, developed Samuel Birch's concept of the Ka as the personality or individuality. 1997, page 125, Wiedemann's conceptions were taken up by H. Sace. 4. Sace, the Ka was seen as the double of the person. It was a real and material being, the object. Seen by the mind when it conceived of it. It was the object's essence and personality, these. Being related to the name of a person. Says, explains Bolshakov, saw the Ka as the spiritual. Reflection of an object, but a spiritual reflection which had a concrete form. 1997, page 126 These concepts were taken up and developed over time to the present day. Many of the ideas were held simultaneously, for example, he notes that for our David the Ka was conceived in terms of spirit, double, life or vital force, self, and the personality. 1997, page 131 I will focus on Bolshakov's conception of the Ka as it reveals the fundamentally different way that Egyptologists approach this issue compared to the theosophical engagement. Bolshakov suggests that Western philosophy lacks an exact synonym for the concept of the Egyptian Ka. He proposes double as the closest approximation. 1997, PG.153, the Ka is intimately related to its representations in the tomb which could be the tomb murals depicting the deceased and the statues of the deceased. These representations are paradoxically both inanimate and animate. The representations in the tomb partake in some way of the things they are intended to portray. The representations evoke the memory of the deceased in the mind of the viewer. This evoked memory image of the deceased is the Ka. This subjective mental image is projected outward to become part of the world out there, to become another object in the world. The Ka becomes a copy of the whole man's individuality including his outer appearance and personal characteristics. 1997, page 152, the Ka is not immaterial, and it is a comprehensive and full copy of the deceased. Bolshakov notes that in Egyptian text when the phrase, for the Ka of Enen, is used, where Enen stands for the name of the deceased, this is equivalent to saying, for Enen. The Ka of an individual is that person in totality. 1997, PG. 
149 the ka is related to the name, ren, of a person. Both the name and the image or representation of the deceased could evoke the deceased in the mind of the living. The name designated a specific individual, the evoked image of which objectified was that individual in full. Bolshakov notes that the ka is both the representation and the double, while the ren is the name and the double. 1997, page 157, both the ren and the ka exist independently of their representations, they are born with the person. Their continued existence in the minds of the living, however, was unstable and unreliable. The tomb representations and statues gave the ka more permanent existence independent of the living capacity to recollect the deceased. The deceased, as the ka, required food for its continued existence in the afterlife. To facilitate this need various representations of food were made in tomb murals. It is the ka of the food offered which the ka of the deceased consumed. The process which characterizes that of the human physical being is that of birth to death. The ka, however, followed a different movement. It was born with the person, and, at the person's death, representations, i murals and statues, were created, which allowed the ka to live in eternity. The ka, therefore, was born twice in a sense, firstly with the person, and, secondly, when the representations were ritually brought to life in the tomb. 1997, page 210, while alive, the Ka maintained an individual's life force and mental activities. Bolshakov distinguishes between what he calls the figurative Ka and the non-figurative Ka. The former is the external Ka, the Ka of the deceased, while the latter was the basis of a person's existence, it regulated his mental and physiological processes, and it enabled both psychic and corporeal activities. 1997. Page 292. The Ka represents a conception of life and a continuative aspect. Finistad, 1986, pg. 363. Following death, one unites with one's Ka emphasizing that life continues after death. The Ka existed in the Ka world, so to speak. This double world was an idealized world, representing the deceased and the preferences of the deceased. It is an incomplete copy of the world depicting the ideal world of the deceased. This double world, portrayed in tombs, represented an ideal reality as conceived by the deceased. It is still a real world and existed in, parallel to the earthly world. To get a sense of the concepts the ancient Egyptians associated with the Ka, I will list a few of the central points made by Egyptologists. I draw on Taylor, 2001, and Ikram, 2003, for these basic ideas. The Ka is non-physical, and has been described as either crucial or the most important aspect of the human being. It is created or formed with the person at their birth. It continues through life and into death where it plays a crucial role. The terms doppelganger and twin have been used to describe it. The Ka was regarded as the animating force of the person. After death it required a physical body or object to inhabit in order to receive the offerings in the tomb. This physical vehicle could be the mummy, the Ka statue, or pictorial representations in the tomb or burial chamber. These offerings sustained the Ka and the deceased, without which they could not survive in the afterlife. It was not thought that the food offerings were physically consumed by the Ka. Rather the symbolic substances fueled the aspects of the person in the afterlife. It is in this sense that the Ka is linked with the concept of a sustaining life force critical to the survival of the individual in the afterlife. Regardless of the specific theosophical correspondence for the Ka, its basic postmortem function has no parallel in theosophical writings. That is, the deceased entity has no need of any sustaining energy from the physical world. Any link to the physical world is regarded as hindering the true afterlife states, and the quicker the four lower theosophical principles 29. Dissolve the more beneficial is for the three higher principles 30 which survive death. I will discuss the process of death in the afterlife states in the following chapter, but at this point it can be noted that there is no theosophical equivalent of the importance of a physical link of 
the deceased entity to a life-sustaining offering in the physical world. What is the theosophical equivalent of the Egyptian Ka? In her earlier writings, H. P. Blavatsky correlates the Ka with the theosophical prana. In the secret doctrine, working with the tables of Massey and Lambert, the Ka is correlated to the astral body, Lambert, or not. Related at all, Massey, this reveals the tension theosophy invokes by needing to identify its concepts with set concepts and other traditions. Later theosophical commentators will reflect this uncertainty between an identification with either the astral double or prana, and each. Choice will be able to be supported by references in H. P. Blavatsky's writings. I suggest then that as H. P. Blavatsky gave no definitive correlation, no ancient wisdom statement on this issue exists, and no thoughts of later commentators will attain the status of uncontested. Acceptance within the Theosophical Society 4.4.3 The Ba It is difficult to do justice in a short space to a complex term like the Egyptian Ba. Gods, humans, and even inanimate things could have a Ba. In some texts, some entities could have more than one Ba, Ba 31. In the context of the king, God or ordinary mortal it signified the manifesting power of that being. The gods then would have more complicated, powerful boss than the humans. The Ba was also the manifesting vehicle of the being, the individual, primarily after death and possibly during sleep. Taylor, 2001, page 20, it was one of the modes of non-physical being the individual could assume after death. It should not be forgotten that. We are referring to a conception of the total individual, not an aspect of an individual such as the soul. While being regarded as non-physical, however, it shared the human characteristics of eating, drinking, speaking, and moving. It was through this entity that the individual could leave the tomb or cemetery. Then it could travel in the afterlife, with the sun and the solar. Bark and in this world. Ikram, 2003 Page 28, a sense of freedom of movement in the capacity to transform characterizes the Ba, and, in the Book of the Dead, the transformation spells list some of the forms into which the deceased can transform after death. The Ba, however, had to return to the deceased mummy or body in order to ensure the survival of the deceased, and various spells and prayers concern the uniting of the Ba and body. This reuniting of the Ba to the mummified corpse constituted a notion of Egyptian resurrection. The Ba, while free to travel in various worlds, of necessity needed to return to the deceased who ideally mummified and, therefore, in a transformed eternal body, could live in eternity. Zabkar in his important study, a study of the Ba concept in ancient Egyptian texts, goes into great detail on this concept throughout Egyptian history. Focusing on its presentation in the Book of the Dead he makes the following conclusions. The Ba comes into existence at or after death, 32. It is corporeal. Being a sort of alter ego, it is the personification of the vital forces of an individual. It is not an aspect of the individual, but represents the fullness of the individual, the totality of the being, 33 and it does not bear any real relationship to the Christian concept of the soul. 1968, PG. 162 Zabkar introduces an important issue in the comparison of the human individual as imagined. In the Theosophical and Egyptian schemes, the Ba is not a part or aspect of the individual. It is one of a variety of shifting modes of being, each representing the totality of the individual. The Ba was not conceived of in ancient Egypt as a spiritual part of man, or as a soul. It was, instead the complete person himself. Zakbar writes in relation to the Ba concept in the coffin. Text, the fact that in each of these forms, body or corpse, Ba, Ka, Ak, Shadow, the deceased acts and lives as a full individual points to a monistic concept of man as opposed to the idea, traditionally attributed to the Egyptians, of a man as a composite of a material and a spiritual element. Even though the Ka and some other of these entities coexisted with the individual during his lifetime, they were, each one of them, considered to be full physical. Entities are not spiritual components of a human composite. 
1968, page 97 This is a different presentation from that of the Theosophical Sevenfold Principles, which are, in a certain sense distinct, with specific qualities associated with them. The lower four dissipate. Following the death of the individual, although they may linger around the body for a shorter or longer length of time, Theosophy certainly expresses itself in terms of distinct soul, spirit, and body divisions. The theosophical equivalent is of the Ba is not simple to establish. The tables above from H.P. Blavatsky's writings suggest it was associated with the theosophical prana, comma, Buddha 35 and Manas. The later theosophical writer, de Purecker, suggests that the human soul is the equivalent of a mortal, human double, equivalent to prana in some of its functions, or to common manas. 36 Oderberg and Wallums make the Ba correspond to the higher manas. 1941, page 439, it presents a difficulty for the theosophical interpretive method to have an Egyptian concept to equate to two theosophical principles, as the number seven is set by H. B. Blavatsky and needs to be maintained. That the Egyptians had a sevenfold classification of principles of the human individual is the one thing she seems certain of. The monistic view of the individual presented by Zabkar, however, renders the theosophical mode of interpretation untenable. The theosophical confusion in trying to pin down a specific correlation reveals the struggle it undergoes to come to grips with a totally different way of presenting the human being. 4.4.4 .4 .4 Ab The heart is one of the most recognizable aspects of the individual in the Egyptian religion. It's most popular depiction is from the judgment scene of the deceased in the Book of the Dead, where it is weighed against the feather of Mutt. The deceased Osiris was referred to as being weary of heart indicating that his heart was not functioning optimally. The heart was symbolic of life, and the deceased, who desired eternal life, required the heart to be awakened in its place in the body. The heart was the only internal organ not removed during the process of mummification. Jan Osman notes that there were two words for heart in ancient Egypt, the J.B. Heart and the Hadi Heart.37 The J.B. Heart was inherited from the individual's mother at birth. This heart bound individuals biologically, from parent to child, and so on. Osman notes that it represented the emotional and cognitive inner life of the individual. 2005, page 30, the Hadi Heart signified consciousness, memory, in mental phenomena. It was not biologically inherited and was connected to the individuality and personal identity. This personal identity needed to be continued into the afterlife as the deceased desired eternal life. The physical heart was the vehicle of the essence of the individual and was the most important part of the physical body. The heart remained preserved through the process of mummification, providing a link between the living and the deceased person. It was further protected in the afterlife by amulets being placed on the body. Ikram 2003, page 24, the heart was the center of the individual, and it governed the body and was the location of the intellect. In memory, Taylor 2001, page 17, it was the heart, as the center of the moral life of the individual, which was weighed against the feather of Mott in the Hall of Judgment. Entrance into the afterlife depended on a successful judgment, and the deceased hoped that his heart would confirm his words during this scene. The only specific mention in the secret doctrine of the Ab, Abhadi, is in the table listing the divisions of Franz Lambert. See Table 5. It is shown as being in correspondence with the Theosophical comma, Desire, Principle. The heart is, however, referred to in a passage in the secret doctrine as the ancestral heart. And in verse 35, addressing a magic formula that which is called, in Egyptian, esotericism, the ancestral heart, or the reincarnating principle, the permanent ego. The defunct says, O oh my heart, my ancestral heart necessary for my transformations. Do not separate thyself from me before the guardian of the scales. Thou art my personality within my breast, divine companion watching over my fleshes, bodies, 1988. Volume 1, page 220 in this passage, 
The ancestral heart is associated with the theosophical reincarnating ego, or the higher manas. The passage itself is in reference to reincarnation. H.P. Blavatsky references this to chapter 64 in the Book of the Dead. In Davis, chapter 64 verses 34 to 35, this is translated as My heart from my mother, my heart from my mother, my heart necessary to my transformations do not rise against me do not bear witness against me do not oppose me among the circle of the gods and do not part with me before the keeper of the scales thou art my personality in my bosom divine partner protecting my flesh 1894 page 104 these verses are to be found in chapter 30b of modern translations of the book of the dead Faulkner translates this as oh my heart which i had for my mother O oh my heart which I had for my mother, O oh my heart of different ages, do not stand up as a witness against me, do not be opposed to me in the tribunal, do not be hostile to me in the presence of the keeper of the balance, for you are my cow which was in my body, the protector who made my members hail. Faulkner, 1972, page 27 Another translation by Allen shows a slightly different wording. I focus on just one sentence which in the secret doctrine refers to the ancestral heart. My heart of my mother, my heart of my mother, my breast that I had on earth, stand. Not against me as witness, oppose me not in the council. 1974, page 39 H. B. Blavatsky shows ancestral heart. Faulkner translates heart of different ages, and Allen. Translates, breast that I had on earth. The sense of the text appears to be the deceased pleading with his heart not to abandon him in his hour of judgment in the afterlife. The life he lived on earth, recorded in his heart, is now to be judged by the weighing of that heart. Against the feather of Mott, the keeper of the balance, the deceased wishes to continue his existence in the afterlife, and requires his heart for this to happen. In the theosophical context, the defunct is appealing to their higher mind or self, to that permanent aspect of themselves which does not die at death, not to be separated from this. Aspect of his constitution is the appeal of the personality, the lower manas or lower self, which wishes to be drawn up into the higher planes after death. The inner or higher planes in this context in the theosophical teachings are the devachan, or abode of bliss, and the secret. Doctrine passage cited above the term fleshes or bodies refers to the various incarnations of the reincarnating ego. In the Egyptian text, the flesh is the physical body, indicating that the deceased expected to exist in a physical body in the afterlife. I will discuss the theosophical use of this passage in the context of reincarnation and in appendix. From the perspective of Egyptology, the context of the passage is in relation to the judgment scene and the opening of the mouth ceremony. Davis's translation makes this Clear in the sentence preceding that quoted above. Now scarabius of hard stone, shaped, coated with gold, shall be placed in the breast of the man to whom shall have been performed the ceremony of the opening of the mouth. 64, verses 33 to 34, 1894, page 104. The opening of the mouth ceremony was that part of the mortuary ritual in which the senses were restored to the deceased. The deceased became a full living corporeal person in the afterlife. The limbs, the members, of the body, or the flesh are restored to the person so that he can live as a full, physical person in the afterlife. The transformations the individual desires are the ability to transform into any being in the afterlife. It signifies the freedom and mobility that the deceased hoped to achieve after death. 4.4.5 The Call of It this term refers to a shadow or shade. Ikram suggests the word for shadow is shuye. 2003, PG.28, as an integral aspect of the human constitution, it could leave the individual and could exist apart from the body. The shadow was viewed as a physical entity and could be seen as another potential, separate mode of existence of the individual following death. It relied on the tomb offerings for sustenance. Budge 1977, P.G. Look for Taylor, the function of the shadow was not clearly defined. It was, however, 
associated with the body, and as being cast by. The body retained a link to it in some manner. 2001, page 24, it was, however, also linked to the Ba, and, like it, returned to the tomb of the deceased at night. From the theosophical perspective various forms of the word are used, Kaba, Shibi and the term shadow itself. What then is the theosophical corresponding principle? De Pirakar N. His encyclopedic theosophical glossary has the following entry, Kaba or Kavid, Egyptian, Shade, Shadow. Many of the deities are represented with two bodies, one often termed the thought body, corresponding to the Maivi Rupa. There were other Egyptian terms for the Maivi Rupa. Blavatsky made Kaba. Equivalent in the human constitution to the spiritual soul or Buddha, whereas Masi made it equivalent to astral body or Linga Sarira, SC2 colon 632-3. See also Ka. The preponderance of statements made by H. P. Blavatsky, though, put the Kaba in correspondence with the astral body, not just in the extracts above from Isis unveiled, and in the collected works, but also in the reading number two where the shadow is made equivalent to the astral body. The list from Franz Lambert in The Secret Doctrine, however, does make the shabby correspond to the theosophical Buddha. In reading number four we note that H. P. Blavatsky makes the co-equivalent to the astral body. What then to make of these seeming inconsistent statements? One would begin by looking for a definitive statement imbued with theosophical authority, without locating that, and being presented with different statements on the same topic, one is forced to conclude that no statement from the ancient wisdom tradition on this issue has been revealed. It is possible that one of the presentations is the real esoteric perspective, but there is no certain way for this to be claimed in the Theosophical Society. In the absence of H. B. Blavatsky, one suspects that no defining statement can ever be made. H. B. Blavatsky's own premise, of a consistent, factual, and scientific ancient wisdom tradition which has been checked and confirmed by generations of adepts forces Theosophy to present consistent teachings on a theme.38. Inconsistencies in later theosophical commentaries reflect uncertainty or ambiguity in the source material. 4.4.6 The coup, Ak one obstacle to discussing this mode of being of the individual is the uncertainty in identifying the theosophical equivalent. There also appears to be a small change in terminology in the field of Egyptology. Budge lists the term coup, but not the term Ak the latter of which is the term both Ikram and Taylor use. Ikram and Taylor do not refer to the term Ku which leads me to conclude that Ku and Nak are the same concept in Egyptology. H. P. Blavatsky, in her article theories about reincarnation and spirits in her collected works, does, however, separate the Ku and the Ak having them correspond to separate theosophical principles. See Table 4. In the series in this article, however, the term Ba is not mentioned. Friedman in her Ph.D. thesis on the meaning of Ak, 3H, in the Egyptian mortuary text has examined this concept in detail. The term Ak has basic meaning of effective and to be effective. It was used in reference to daily life situations and was transferred to concepts relating to the afterlife. To become an Ak meant to become an effective transfigured. Deceased? It is important to note that Friedman, following in the work of Zabkar, also regards the Akka's one way in which the full individual can exist and not merely as a spiritual aspect of the deceased. The Akka was capable of full physical life including the ability to move freely and engage in sexual functions. 1981, page 14, there was a change in emphasis in Egyptian thought in relation to the Akka from the pyramid text to the coffin text to the book of the dead, this Change mirrors the changes in the Egyptian religion itself. It also has associations beyond the individual however I focus on this aspect of the Ak. In the coffin text, the Ak was a synonym for the deceased who remained a corporeal, effective entity requiring food offerings. Emphasizing its corporeal aspect was the notion that it could perform labor in the afterlife. 1981, page 134, without the physical body. The deceased could not effectively function in the 
Afterlife. 1981, page 235 Budge writes, The Ku, or spiritual soul, is often mentioned in connection with the Ba or heart soul, and it seems to have been regarded as an ethereal being, in fact the soul, which under no circumstances could die, it dwelled in the Sahu or spiritual body. 1977, PG. 62, for Ikram. The Ak 39 was the outcome of the union between the Ba and the Ka, and it had celestial or stellar associations. Becoming an Ak, or the deceased in the afterlife figured as an eternal, living being of light, was the hope for goal of people. 2003, page 31, only those persons, however, who were positively judged in the afterlife would be transformed into the state. Those found wanting against the harmony of Ma would face annihilation instead. In the old kingdom, the Ak was chiefly identified with the gods and kings. Only in later periods of Egyptian history was this transformation associated with the common people of Egypt. The Ak came into being only after death, although preparations for this state could begin while alive, and reflected the successful transformation of the person from a mortal to an immortal state. Ikram 2003 Page 31 to enable the transformation into an Ak the deceased was also required to have prepared the required offerings and to have magical knowledge of the various spells. Taylor confirms the Ak, transfigured being, as being the state of existence the deceased hoped to achieve. It is a state of existence where the deceased became associated or identified with the gods, and mirrored, or participated, in the movements of the gods. 2001, page 31, the Gods themselves were Ak, but in terms of the transfigured deceased it is hard to describe the condition better than Taylor does when he writes, to be Ak, then, was to be an effective spirit, enjoying the qualities and prerogatives of gods, having the capacity for eternal life and being capable of influencing other beings. 2001, page 32, Taylor suggests the Ak differs from the Ka and Ba and Ren as their aspects of the individual while the Ak is a state which is attained only after a successful judgment in the afterlife. 2001, page 32, the Ak was also specifically associated with light. This is a complicated term to consider in the theosophical context. The later commentator, Godfrey de Pirucker, makes Aku, Ku, Chu and Ko all synonyms. Fori Oderberg and Wellams, however, have seemingly separated the Aku, Atman, from the Ku, comma. 1941. PG.428-9, complicating the article by Oderberg and Wellam article is that, on their first diagram, correspondences between the celestial and human hierarchies they list the series. Set, Ku, comma. 1941, page 428, on their diagram on the next page a diagram of the causal potential, men according to the ancient Egyptians, however, they list the series as set, ka, comma, 1941, page 429, as both ku and ka are potential Egyptian terms it becomes difficult to follow the correspondence in the minds of the authors. One wonders whether an error has crept into the article at some point. In her early writings, H. B. Blavatsky makes the ak correspond to the theosophical monis. Principle. In my table 5, Aku is shown next to the Kama Rupa in the Massey origin table, and in the Franz Lambert origin table, she is shown in correspondence with Atman. Intuitively I feel the Atman correspondence is more correct from a theosophical perspective, it is, however, not unambiguously supported in H. B. Blavatsky's writings. Like many other Egyptian, Theosophical correspondences there is no unanimity in the source writings, and as such there can be no ancient wisdom statement. A member of the Theosophical Society could argue for a variety of correspondences with reference to supporting origin literature. 4.4.7 The Sekum Butch defines the Sekum, or power as the incorporeal personification of the vital force of A. Man, 1977, PG. 62 Neither Ikram nor Taylor appears to mention the Sekum in relation to the human constitution. Lurker, in his An Illustrated Dictionary of the Gods and Symbols of 
Ancient Egypt, confirms Sekhemhet's power. 1994, page 105. The term also refers to certain entities in the chain of being, for example stars, which are located between humans and the gods. Associated with Osiris, it was a divine characteristic and a manifestation of power. From the theosophical perspective, H. B. Blavatsky does not mention the term in various presentations of the human constitution of ancient Egypt. She does mention the term twice in the Sacred Doctrine. 41. I have discussed the one verse in reading number three above, where Sekum appears to be either a deity or a place, or both, which has a function in the afterlife. The following verse in the Sacred Doctrine is, perhaps, better discussed in the chapter on the afterlife, but for the sake of completeness I quote it here. For say Khan is the residence or loka of the god Khem, Horus Osiris, or father and son, hence the Devachan of Atma Buddha. In the ritual of the dead the defunct is shown entering into Sekhem with Horus thought and emerging from it as a pure spirit. 64, 29 it is in Sekum that lies concealed the mysterious face, or the real man concealed. Under the false personality, even exoterically Sekum is the residence of the god. Kem, in Kem is horse avenging the death of his father Osiris, hence punishing the sins of man when he becomes a disembodied soul. 1988, Volume 1, page 222 separate terms are used above, say Ken and Sekum, despite the different spelling in two. Consecutive sentences I have regarded them as synonyms. The Theosophical Glossary lists Sekum and Zekton as synonyms, defining them as Devachan, the place of post-mortem. Reward, a state of bliss, not a locality. 1990, page 294, Godfrey de Purecker, and his Encyclopedic Theosophical Glossary, lists an entry for Sekum as Egyptian, a shrine or Sanctuary the gods of the shrine, the vital power of a human being, any power, spiritual or physical, as a verb, to read, be strong, etc. The theosophical sense of these passages is that Sekum is an after-death state, the Devachan, and location wherein the higher principles rest. Between incarnations. One can also note in these passages two further correspondences given for Atma and Buddha. In H. B. Blavatsky's writings, Osiris for Atman and Horus for Buddha. 4.4.8 The Ren. The Ren or name was another important element of the Egyptian constitution. The name conferred not just identity but even existence itself to the person. This appears to be true for the mortal life and for the survival of the person after death. There was thought to be a deep connection between a person's name and that person's essential existence or individuality. Offerings to the deceased were presented in the name of the deceased and they aided in the continuance of their existence. In the tomb or grave, various objects were inscribed with the name of the deceased, objects which could act as vehicles for the Ka and Ba. In the magical sphere, knowledge of a person's, or God's, name could give one power over that being. Ikram 2003, PG.24-26 Taylor suggests that the Ren was one of the media through which an individual's existence was made manifest. It contained the essence of the person. 2001, page 23 The loss, destruction, or forgetting of the name could result in the individual ceasing to exist. I have not found any reference to the term or concept Ren in the writings of H. P. Blavatsky. It is not referred to in any of her correspondence charts, nor is it listed in any of the indexes to her works I have examined. Oderberg and Wellen suggest the ran or essence. Corresponds to the transmuted individuality of a man which is developed through the aspirations and effort of the personality. 1941. Page 437. The importance placed by Egyptians. On the concept of the ren is not reflected in general theosophical thought. The survival of an individual's name in a physical or even mental memory way is not important for the deceased continued existence in the afterlife. Instead, death is ideally accompanied by the complete disintegration of the physical or four lower human principles. The three higher principles withdraw into the inner planes, unconnected to all intents and purposes with the physical world. 4.5 Conclusion 
Theosophy presents a relatively consistent set of teachings on the seven principles which constitute the individual. The meaning set associated with each principle is well defined and widely accepted across theosophy. While there are variations, or elaborations, over time these are well integrated in the theosophical world. The seven principles are one of the fundamental statements of theosophy in its ancient wisdom tradition. Any tradition aiming for theosophical acceptance must mirror this sevenfold presentation. Almost any theosophical engagement with another tradition involves locating the theosophical seven principles in its teachings through various interpretive techniques. H.P. Blavatsky presents no systematic or consistent theosophical teaching on the constitution of an individual in the Egyptian religion. There are variations in her presentation over time as her works are published. These variations in presentation make it difficult for a definitive position to be found in her theosophical writings on this issue. This leads to inconsistencies in the writings of later theosophists who select one or other presentation as a foundation. For later theosophists, there would be the need to explain the various inconsistent presentations. In terms of my basic thought, H. B. Blavatsky makes content-specific statements. Various content-specific statements which are at variance with one another are simply that statements which are in contradiction to one another. It is the role of the academic to note these different positions, while it is the role of theosophists to make sense of them. Inconsistencies in the source material call into question the foundation of the theosophical self. Presentation as a scientific record of the knowledge of generations of adepts. Where inconsistencies exist, statements need to be judged and evaluated. This process of second level. Evaluation by theosophical commentators is subjective and it lacks the charismatic force of primary statements by H. B. Blavatsky. A further result of the inconsistencies in the foundation writings of H. B. Blavatsky is that later theosophical writers will present alternate readings of the same text. We will find, therefore, different correspondences between the Egyptian and theosophical principles presented by later theosophical writers. H. P. Blavatsky also does not appear to engage in any detail directly with primary Egyptian texts. Instead using the works of other scholars to support her general themes.42 she does not show any real knowledge of Egyptian sources or teachings beyond those already in the public arena. Her references to occult Egyptian works not available to the public would need to be treated with suspicion by academics until they become available for general scrutiny. A basic conceptual problem with the theosophical presentation and interpretation is that it can often be based on superficial similarity, but it takes no notice of the wider context of the concept under examination. For example, while Egyptians may have had a term translatable as double in English, this does not mean that the functions associated with this entity mirror those of the equivalent theosophical term, astral double. This forces the theosophical Interpretive moves invoking the various strategies I outlined in Chapter 3, by positing an underlying esoteric meaning, which was correct in the beginning and basically unchanging over time, the theosophical interpretation is unable, and would perhaps regard it as unnecessary, to contextualize any particular teaching. It must seek uniform meaning and would need to explain changes in meaning and usage of time. Various coping strategies would need to be invoked to do this. Despite the theosophical use of tables to identify and correlate equivalent terms and concepts, there may not always be one-to-one -one correspondences. The theosophical system presents a set of theoretically discrete principles. These principles may not be subject to such set divisions in the human life is lived, there is a sense that there are also theoretical constructs, and the Egyptian scheme some of the aspects of the individual appear to contain characteristics of two or more theosophical principles. This is sanction in theosophical thought. Different world systems may well present the human individual in their own unique way. At issue is that, should the presentation differ from the theosophical scheme, it would no longer represent the school of esotericism to which H. P. Blavatsky belonged, the ancient wisdom school. A. 
Relevant point here is that H. B. Blavatsky presentation of the principles did evolve with more subtle divisions coming into play in her esoteric instructions and inner group teachings. These postate the secret doctrine, and it is a point to be debated as to whether the later amendments should be retrospectively read into her earlier works. The human individual in the Egyptian and theosophical schemes is rooted in their own larger context. The functions and purposes of these aspects of the individual, principles in theosophy, are intimately related to this larger religious context. The Egyptian texts which have survived reveal a focus on the afterlife, and a quest for eternity in that life. Many of the aspects or modes of being which the Egyptian texts deal with are involved with concerns of this afterlife existence. From the theosophical perspective, there is not the same uniform focus on the afterlife. Only the higher principles survive the death of the individual for any length of time. Theosophy is concerned with the embodied and after-death state of the individual. Part of the focus of the theosophical presentation is the linking of the individual through his principles to the cosmos or solar system. The principles are associated with different planes and functions. A vast system of correspondences is revealed knowledge of which can lead to dangerous actions and power on the part of individuals. It is partly through a process of decontextualization that the Egyptian terms are appropriated into the theosophical scheme. This decontextualizing is highlighted by the monistic view of the individual of academic Egyptology. This view of the individual is fundamentally at odds with the theosophical concept of the individual which more closely mirrors classical Greek and Christian views of body, soul, and spirit. The nature of the theosophical system of H. B. Blavatsky is such that it cannot integrate different perspectives of the individual, it can only correct through its interpretative moves. The theosophical search for fundamental unity, in fact a search for itself and world tradition shows its shortcomings as an interpretive technique. That said, H. P. Blavatsky's presentation may reflect or mirror some perspectives current in her time. Egyptology has evolved as an academic science, and an academic review and evaluation of theosophy must be rooted in her historical context. That theosophical perspectives do not appear to have stood the test of time as a criticism of the theosophical interpretive technique which is rooted in an esoteric wisdom complete in the beginning. In the following chapter, I will examine the theosophical presentation of death in the afterlife in the teachings of ancient Egypt. It is the human being who dies, and the interpretive. Problems of theosophy are magnified as the aspects of the individual are embodied in the context of a specific religious doctrine.